All right, so uh, you see my sermon title, Crawling in Abraham's Footsteps. I uh, originally titled it, Walking in Abraham's Footsteps, from a passage in Romans chapter 4. Um, go ahead and turn there. <clears throat> but then after I got developing my sermon, I realized that really a lot of this is learning how to walk in the footsteps of Abraham, not just walking as though, you know, we're already experts at it, because we're not. We're, before you walk, you have to crawl. You have to learn how to stand, and you have, you have to learn how to crawl, and then you can eventually learn how to walk. And walking by faith, as Abraham did, is something that doesn't just happen overnight, at least not for most of us. It's something we have to learn to do. You know, when a little child learns how to walk, they first, they try to stand, and they're all wobbly, and they don't really, they can't really trust their balance and their feet and the things around them. And uh, they start with baby steps, right? And that's really what the way we have to do when we walk by faith as, um, as Abraham did. So let's take our Bibles, go to Romans chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> what then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And here the Apostle Paul begins to quote from Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Now what is grace? Some of you kids should be able to answer that term. What is grace? Yes. Grace is God's love. All right, it certainly involves that. Anybody else want to add to that? Yes. Well, it can involve forgiveness, but that's not really the root meaning. It is giving someone favor, not because they deserve it, not because they earned it, but because you simply want to bestow favor upon them. Like All right. I'm sorry, what? Is it like daddy's one more time and I'm going to give you a pat? No, that's... <laughs> <laughs> That one more time is actually mercy, not grace. But <laughs> the easy way to remember the difference between grace and mercy. Let me turn off my phone. The easy way to remember uh, grace is God giving us that which we don't deserve, giving us favor which we don't deserve, and mercy is the opposite of that. That is God not giving us what we deserve. That is, we deserve to be punished and God withholds his punishment. So, in a sense, they're, they're certainly related, but, uh, but anyway. Um, so, what did Abraham find? It says, um, what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. That is, if Abraham had performed all these good deeds for God, then God, in a sense, would owe him if he was doing these things for God. But it says, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is, a, is accounted for righteousness. Now this is an interesting word. That word accounted is a, is a term that's a, an accounting term, and it means to be reckoned. Um, Abraham's, well, well let me ask you this, was Abraham perfect before God? Was Abraham always righteous before God in all the things he did? No. We know that Abraham sinned on more than one occasion. But what did God do? It says God counted his faith for righteousness. That is, in place of righteousness. Which tells us something very important about God. Is God more interested in his children being perfect in every detail you know, being able to cross off every commandment and, and so forth, that I did everything God said that I should do, is God more interested in that, or is he more interested in us trusting him? It's trust. 
And isn't that true of a parent and a child? As a, it, those of you who have children, are you, are you more interested in your child being able to check off that they did everything you said to do, or are you more interested that your child absolutely trusts you? Yes. We can put up with imperfect children, can't we? If they trust us. If they don't trust us, then we got a big problem. And this is the way God dealt with, with all humanity, but how he dealt with Abraham. And the reason the Bible says in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness is because Moses, when he's writing that, he wants to emphasize this fact that seems to be kind of counterintuitive. You know, people think, you know, you've got God up there and he's got his commandments and we just keep his commandments. But God is looking for something else. Sure, he wants us to keep his commandments, but he's looking for something else. And this statement is made about Abraham and how Abraham pleased God, not by being perfect, but by absolutely trusting him in the promises that he gave to him. So he goes on, he says, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Quoting Psalm 32, he says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Now that's an interesting term there. Impute is also an accounting term. And it's basically saying, blessed is the man whom God doesn't count his sins against him. It doesn't say blessed is the man who does not sin. It's blessed is the man whom God does not reckon his sins against him or doesn't hold his sins against him. And this is because faith, trust in God outweighs our perfection as far as God is concerned. So Paul goes on, he says, does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only or upon uh, the uncircumcised also, that is Jew versus Gentile? For we say that faith was reckoned or accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? And so Paul answers his own question because if you go back to Genesis and read this, the statement that that uh, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, righteousness is made before God commanded Abraham to circumcise himself and his uh, son Ishmael at the time, and so forth. So he says, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he, that is Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that is, though they are Gentiles, that righteousness might, might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, that is, Jews, but who also walk in the steps. Now, this is where my sermon title comes from. Those who walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while he was uncircumcised. I want you to notice that the steps are not every step that Abraham took because Abraham made a few missteps along the way. Is that right? But it's the steps of the faith or the trust which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. For the promise that he would be heir of the world, that he would inherit all of this land, was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. Now we know that's true because the law didn't come until 430 years later. But through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. That is, if you can earn your salvation by keeping the law, then what's the point of the promise God made to Abraham, which was based on his belief and his trust? Because the law brings about wrath, or where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith, or it is by faith, that it might be according to grace. That is, again, according to God favoring us, not because we deserve to be favored, but because God simply wants to pour out his favor on us. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. This is a pretty remarkable passage, in my opinion, but you cannot 
get around the idea that our salvation and Abraham's salvation is all rooted in our absolute trust in God's promises. But, you know, you might think, well, that's great because faith is easy. Keeping every little commandment is hard. Does that sound right? No, it's not easy. Because if you continue to read the story of Abraham, what did God ask him to do to prove his faith? First, leave your homeland and go to the place that I'm going to show you. And I'm not even going to tell you where it is until you get there. Second, take your son, the one that I promised I was going to make a great nation out of, and offer him up as a burnt offering. Faith was hard. And faith will be hard in the end times. And following in Abraham's footsteps is not going to be a cakewalk. No pun intended. Yeah, pun intended, I guess. All right. Go over to um, Galatians chapter 3. I want to read verses 6 through 9. This is funny because the Apostle Paul quotes the very same statement from Genesis 15. It says, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Now what Paul has done in that statement is he has said essentially that all those Jews who were keeping the law of Moses but who were not walking in the faith of Abraham, that they are not Abraham's descendants as far as God is concerned as far as the inheritance is concerned. <clears throat> Verse 8, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. And that was one of the statements God made to Abraham. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. You see, our union with Abraham as the seed of Abraham comes through faith. And it comes through faith in that promised seed that was part of the covenant that um, God gave to Abraham. Um, as we all know, in the verse 16, it talks about that singular seed who is Christ, right? The one in the promise um, of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, I want you to, I want to uh, emphasize the fact that when God made the promise to Abraham, he also tested him and then God swore an oath. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 22. And um, I want to read verses 6 through 18. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, my father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. I would like for you to underline that statement, please. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. All the statements in the New Testament that refer to Christ as being the lamb of God uh, John the Baptist made that statement several times. They come from this passage. Uh, verse 9. And they came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood on the altar, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel, or the messenger of the Lord, called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, so he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad, or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now this was the testing of Abraham's faith. You see, faith is not perfected until it's tested. And this is something that a lot of Christians don't realize. That walking in the footsteps of Abraham is not just saying I believe something, or living according to certain things. It's when God, when being a true follower of Christ requires something of you that's going to cost you dearly. And you put your faith in God's promises and you go through with it anyway, 
that your faith is tested. And this is what happened to Abraham in the extreme, as we see. So it says then, um, verse 12, he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Meaning, me, the messenger of the Lord. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Now, verse 14 is, is glossed over by a lot of people. They don't really see anything important in it, but it's extremely important. It says, Abraham called the name of that place, quote, the Lord will provide, or in Hebrew it's Jehovah or Yahweh Jireh. The Lord will provide. As it is now, notice these words. As it is said to this day, and then Moses gives a quotation or a phrase or a saying that was repeated by people from Abraham's time all the way up until the time that Moses wrote this was which was while the children of Israel were in the wilderness. So this day was right was after the Exodus. So as it is said to this day, in other words, what happened with Abraham and what and how Abraham um, named that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, a saying came from this incident. And most likely it came from Abraham himself. But look what the saying is. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. I want you to notice the future tense of the verb. It's the saying is not, in the mountain of the Lord, it was provided. Because that would account for the ram being provided as a sacrifice in place of Isaac, right? But that's not what it says. It says, in the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now, we know from our study through the rest of the Old Testament that that mountain is where God's temple was built by Solomon. It's later where the, the later rebuilt temple was, and the kingdom temple is going to be there as well, at that very place where, a, you know, what's, what's so amazing about this passage to me is that what God asked Abraham to do was to experience a little bit of what he was going to go through when he offered up his only begotten son. And Hebrews actually uses that phrase. That, that phrase, only begotten son, is used all through John's Gospel of Christ. In St. John 3, 16, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes... There it is, the faith of Abraham. God gave the offering, only this time he didn't stop the execution. He let it go through. And God himself endured the grief and the sacrifice of seeing his own son being put to death. That's a pretty remarkable thing. It's a very remarkable thing. Abraham had a little glimpse of that, didn't he? God stopped him from slaying his own son, but he was about to do it. So you know Abraham experienced a lot of grief while he was walking up that mountain with his son. <clears throat> That's how committed he was. And we know that the book of Hebrews says that Abraham believed that God was going to, he was so convinced that God was going to fulfill the promise that he made through that boy that he said he believed that God would raise the dead in order to fulfill his promise, that he believed he would raise Isaac from the dead. It's a really, really remarkable statement, but that's the kind of faith that we're talking about when we're talking about walking in the footsteps of Abraham. It's some pretty powerful faith. Now, let's go to, um, let's go to Hebrews chapter 6.
verse 13. It's, uh, unfortunately, our, the New King James Version kind of waters down what this is saying because it says, when God made a promise to Abraham. And it's, it's written as though, you know, God is, is faithful to keep his promise to Abraham. And, and whatever promises he made to us, he's going to fulfill to us as well. In other words, equating, equating the reliability of God's promises. But it's doing more than that. It's actually equating the promise. All right, because it literally says, uh, instead of when God made a promise to Abraham, it literally says, for God, when promising Abraham, referring to the specific promises or promise that he made to Abraham, uh, for when God, when promising Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now, patiently endured is, that phrase is referring to his faith being tested with um, Isaac. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. I, I didn't finish reading the passage in Genesis, but it goes on to say, uh, actually it quotes it here, where it says, God says, uh, by myself I have sworn, that is, he is going to do, fulfill the covenant that he made to Abraham. So it says, thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, that is the original promise, and secondly, the oath that he swore after Abraham was tested, two immutable things or unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil. Abraham had a hope. And it was the hope that Abraham had that God was going to fulfill the promises that he made to him. Not only that his son would become a great nation, but that God was going to give to Abraham and his seed all this land as an everlasting possession. And uh, it says here that we have this hope, the same hope that Abraham had. He looked to the future, to God's promise, and he, in his life, he didn't get bogged down in this present life. He kept that hope always in front of him, and he was always striving so that he would attain that hope that God had given him. Now, let's go over to... Um, Genesis chapter 12. Verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, I want you to note it says had said, because it's referring to something God had said to him previously. Uh, and we'll see that in a moment. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your... Now, notice these words. Get out of your country, number one. From your family, that is, separate from your family. And from your father's house. To a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, flip over quickly to Acts chapter 7. And uh, Stephen gives us a little bit more information about this event. Because, again, as I said, it says God had said to Abraham. Stephen takes it back to when God originally said it to Abraham. All right, so let's, let's look at this. Verse 1, verse 2. And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Now notice this when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. The passage in Genesis 12 talks about when he was in Haran after this, which is why it says God had said. And he said to him, get out of your country. This is what God said to him originally when he was in his own land. 
Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to the land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, notice this, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell, which was the land of Canaan, which was the land that God promised that he would have as an everlasting inheritance. Now, the things I want to point out to you is that God told him he had to separate himself from some things in order to have God's inheritance. What were those things? His country and his extended family. And here's something for us living in the end times, because we are on the final stretch to making it in the footsteps of Abraham into the resurrection of the just, where that Abraham himself is going to receive the inheritance, and Abraham's seed, who we are if we belong to Christ, will also receive the inheritance along with Abraham. There is a separating that goes on. If we're going to walk in the footsteps of Abraham, what you're going to find is you can't bring everybody and everything with you. There's going to have to be a separation. And the reason is, why did God say, leave your family? Why did he tell him to leave his family? Why did he say, bring your family? His family was pagan. His family was not on board. His family didn't trust in the one true God. And so Abraham went, but he, did he take any of his family? Besides his wife, of course, Sarah. But did he take anyone else in his family? Who did he take? His father, father Terah, who we know from, from uh, extra-biblical writings actually was pagan. And who else? Lot, his brother's son, yeah. right? Lot, his brother's son, was... Abraham's father on board with this trek, with this promise, with this God that Abraham served. No. Which is why he, had, he stopped in Terah, uh, he, uh, he stopped in Haran, and not until his father died did God then say, okay, now your father's dead, now I want you to go into the land of Canaan, where I'm going to give you the inheritance. He also took Lot, his nephew, with him. Was Lot on the same page? What's that? It doesn't really seem like it. It doesn't, does it? What happened when they got to the land and God gave Abraham the promise? What happened to Lot? He selected the best land and went to it. All right. You know what? You, you know the story of Lot's wife, right? She kind of had her eyes looking back. Well, so did Lot. A little bit. Maybe not as bad as his wife. And Lot ended up being saved in the end. Hebrews 11 says that, that Lot was righteous. But Lot had his problems. And it caused him a lot of grief, including the loss of his wife. Lot had his problems. Because Lot, if you remember the story when, they, when Abraham and Lot separated, they were, there was conflict between Abraham's servants and Lot's servants. And they're you know, feeding their cattle and so forth. And so they needed to separate from each other. And Abraham said to Lot, you know, you take, you choose whatever part, whatever land you want to choose, and I'll take what's left. And so Lot chose the lush area around Sodom and Gomorrah because it was a really nice agricultural area, while the place where Abraham was was more like a desert. Right? But Abraham didn't worry about the, the vegetation or any of that stuff. Abraham knew God was leading him and God was guiding him and whatever his cattle needed, God would provide, right? And so Lot, but Lot was not quite so trusting of God and it caused Lot a lot of grief. And I think this is a good object lesson for us. If we're, if we're going to follow in Abraham's footsteps, we are going to find that there may be people in our extended family, or there probably are people in our extended family, that are not going to come along with us as we, if we trace those footsteps. And we have to decide, are we going to follow in those footsteps, or are we going to let family, extended family, hold us back? See, unbelief will, will allow them to hold you back. But the faith of Abraham, the trust in Abraham was, you know what, I'm going 
to follow God and his promise no matter whether my family is coming on board or not. I'm going. And he did. He had to abandon his country too. And that's something that a lot of, uh, of Americans have difficulty swallowing. Because in a lot of American churches, patriotism and Christianity are almost interchangeable. You know what I'm talking about? Patriotism's okay up to a point. But there's a time when we have to choose God's promises over patriotism. We have to not, we have to disengage from politics and those kinds of things and, have, and be kingdom minded because Christ is returning and he is going to overthrow the kingdoms of the world and that includes the United States of America includes the army and military of the United States of America. This is all the nations are going to come against him at that day. And you can see now how much our country has turned against God and turned against Christ. And when you, when you look at that, you look at Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth rise up and take counsel against the Lord and against his Christ, saying, let us break their bonds asunder and cast their cords away from us. Revelation 19 says the kings of the earth, when they that they gather together at Armageddon, it says they gather to make war with the one sitting on the white horse, which is Christ. That is, their intent for bringing all their military hardware is to shoot down Christ at the second coming and shoot down his angelic army and blow him to smithereens. And they, are, they actually believe it, which is part of the deception that's going to go out in the end times. It'll pro, it'll, Satan will probably portray it as an alien invasion or something. Right? And they're, get, they're going to gather there for that, for that purpose. It's pretty, it's pretty remarkable. But I, well, read Zechariah 14 if you want to see what happens to them. You ever see uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark at that scene at the end when they open the thing up and all the people, their skin starts melting and... Well, that's what's, is, that comes right out of Zechariah 14. That's what's going to happen. It says at the second coming of Christ, that they're, those who rise up against him, it says their flesh is going to consume away while they're standing on their feet. That's pretty, uh, pretty amazing stuff. Anyway, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to read verses uh, 8 through 16. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And that's talking about the restored Jerusalem that Isaiah prophesies uh, throughout the last several chapters of Isaiah. Abraham was aware of that city. And he was looking for it. He was looking forward to it. But what I want you to notice, it says that he dwelled in the land of promise. God let him go to the place that he was going to give him as a permanent inheritance, but he didn't have any of it. He didn't have it as an inheritance, right? And um, actually, I was, in, uh, I was in Acts 7. I didn't finish reading the passage there, but it says that, that um, God made that promise to Abraham and to his seed, but while Abraham was alive, he did not even receive one foot of that inheritance. That is, he lived out his entire life, and then his son Isaac lived out his entire life, and then his grandson Jacob lived out most of his life, in that land, yet not having received the promise that God made. But they were looking forward to it. Let's look at what it says here in Hebrews 11. It says, um, verse 9, By faith he dwelled in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now, what I want you to notice is, walking in the footsteps of Abraham means living like a foreigner, living like a sojourner in the land. 
Now, what does that mean to live like a foreigner or a sojourner? Unattached. Unattached. Why did he live in a tent? Why did he build a house? Because a tent is a temporary dwelling. A house is more like a permanent dwelling. And Abraham felt like he was walking a journey. Even though he was in the land, he didn't own the land. Abraham was waiting for God to fulfill the promise, not for himself to fulfill the promise. And this is also an important point. If we're going to walk in the footsteps, or crawl, I should say, in the footsteps of Abraham, we need to have a alien mentality, that we are aliens here, that we are sojourners here, that we are only passing through right now. This is not our home in the sense of it belonging to us now. This isn't it. It will be when the promise is fulfilled, but it's not now. Um, verse. Uh, let's go down to verse, well, let me keep reading here. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him faithful who, was, who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. These all died in faith not having received the promises. That, that means not having received the fulfillment of the promises. But having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth or on the land. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had, been, if they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. I like that phrase, called to mind. If they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, which was Ur of the Chaldees, which was a pretty prosperous place. If they kept thinking back to where they came from, and the, you know, you remember the story of the uh, Israelites when they came out of Egypt. They kept thinking back. You know what? Well, we had it better in Egypt. We we had better food. We had, you know, stuff like that. And they kept complaining. But what it says here, it says, if they had called to mind. What it means is they didn't. They could have constantly been remembering where they came from and all the good things they had before they came out to live in a tent. But they didn't. What was the difference? They kept their focus on the promise. Isn't that right? Anyway, um, let's go down to verse um, 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said, was said, In Isaac your seed shall be call, called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. It's very, very remarkable stuff. All right, let's go down to, uh, he, flip over to Hebrews chapter 12, just on the next page. Verse 1. Now, chapter 11 talks about Abraham and so forth, but it talks about a lot of other people also who walked by faith, the same kind of faith that Abraham had in the promises. And it ends in verse 39 by saying, All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. That is, they did not see the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham, they didn't see it in their lifetime. But yet, despite that, they continued to walk by faith all the way into, up until they died. And then it says, verse 40, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. That is, God is providing something better than what we have. He's providing the Abrahamic inheritance for us also. And he's delayed the resurrection so that we could be a part of it, so that we could be included and be blessed with Abraham in the resurrection. Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, Jesus himself walked this path also. And he endured a lot of hardship, including his own crucifixion. But what this passage is saying is that he, Jesus himself was focused on the end goal. Right? Jesus himself was. All right, let's look at... Um, um, Galatians chapter 4. You guys remember the Hagar incident? <laughs> For lack of a better term. I said earlier that Abraham made some mistakes, right? What was Abraham's biggest mistake? It's the Hagar incident, right? Go to Galatians 4. <coughs> And uh, let's read verse 21 through 31. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. What does that mean? Yes. All right. What did Abraham do? You're right. What did Abraham do there? At the instigation of Sarah, of course. What did he do? He took matters into his own hands. Right? He took God's promise that God was going to give him a son, and he thought, I can make it happen. I can fulfill the promise. Maybe God wants me to just, you know, since Sarah's too old to have a child, uh, you know, she's got a maid, a younger woman, and she said, you know, I should take her and produce a child with her. And so Abraham gave it to his wife, and he did that, and he had a son, and God rejected Ishmael. He said uh, that the covenant was not going to go through Ishmael. He says that Isaac, in Isaac your seed will be called, before Isaac was even born. Abraham took matters into his own hands. He did not wait on the Lord. Let's look at this passage here. Uh, verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. That's, Hagar is a representation of the law that God gave Israel at Mount Sinai, and all those who were following the law and had rejected Christ, uh, he puts all in that same category. For this is, this is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. He said that because by this time, Israel or Jerusalem had rejected Jesus Christ and had crucified him because they said, we follow Moses, we don't know who this guy is. But the Jerusalem above, or literally the elevated Jerusalem, the elevated Jerusalem is the Jerusalem in Isaiah 2, where it says that when Jerusalem is restored, it's going to be lifted up above the mountains and, and all that. But it says the elevated Jerusalem is free, which is the mother of us all, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are, in, who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. That's a quote from Isaiah 54. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We're the children of Sarah, children of the promise. And of course, that, uh, we're told how that takes place back in chapter 3, the last few verses. Verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, 
For you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is the promise of the resurrection and the inheritance. The, I think the important point that we need to let sink in with regard to the Hagar incident is that trying or attempting to bring about God's plan in the flesh, that is by our own strength, by our own ideas, by our own efforts, as opposed to waiting for God. See, this is the thing that a lot of people miss, that is Abraham waited a really long time. He waited a long time. Abraham was 70 years old when God first made the promise to him, told him to leave and to go out, and that he was going to give him a son and give him his inheritance and all this stuff. He was 70 years old when that happened. And not until 30 years later was Isaac born, when Abraham was 100 years old. And the Hagar incident occurred like 16 years before that, because Abraham got impatient with waiting for God. You know how many Psalms there are that talk about waiting on the Lord? There's a lot. Waiting on the Lord. You know what that means? Part of walking or crawling, in our case, in the footsteps of Abraham, is standing still and waiting for God to make the next move. And as times get difficult in the end times, we're going to, we're going to want to have our own Hagar incident because things are heating up and we're getting a little nervous about how God's going to fulfill his promises to us. And we're going to be tempted to pull a Hagar instead of waiting on the Lord to guide us to open the door, to put the, the, his, his open door right smack in front of us so we know it's him. See, when God is moving, when God is moving you, he'll make it clear that it's him that's doing it. So don't be in such a hurry to go off on some tangent thinking that you are preparing for the end times or, you know, there's a lot of areas in your life that this can be applied to. Looking for a mate is one, right? Looking for, you know, relocating could be one. But God will open doors and he will close doors. And you need to be patient. A lot of us, you know, I, I talk to young people from time to time who are like, you know, I'm, I'm, out, I'm out of high school or I'm out of college or whatever. And, uh, you know, I just I have no idea what I'm going to do. I have no clue what I'm going to do. And sometimes you need to wait. You need to pray, though. You need to pray and you need to wait on God doesn't mean you shouldn't get a job, okay? But as far as, as your, uh, your permanent, where you, what you're going to do permanently, you, you may need to wait. I just want to go to Psalm 37 and, and uh, emphasize this point. Psalm, you all know Psalm 37. It's one of our favorite psalms. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. They shall soon be cut off like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and I love this part. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord. Again, wait on the Lord. You'll find this all over the Psalms. And, you know, when David writes those who wait on the Lord, or Isaiah talks about those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, and so forth. Did David have any experience in waiting on the Lord? Can you think of any incidents where David chose not to do the Hagar incident? Uh, oh. Right, and he had opportunity to kill Saul, who was trying to kill him. 
But David refused to do so because David said, I, if God has said he's going to make me king, God's going to have to do it. I'm not going to do it myself, which he easily could have done. He had at least two opportunities to kill Saul while he was sleeping, or in one case he was relieving himself. And he chose not to do it. His men wanted to do it. He chose not to do it because he was going to wait for God to do it. And waiting on the Lord is not always an easy thing. But, you know, God knows who we are. He knows if we are his children or not. And he is not going to leave us blowing in the wind out there. He is going to lead us. A lot of times we think God isn't leading us because he's not ready for us to move. Right? Remember the song we sang? Where you go, I'll go. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. God did that with Israel in the wilderness. He had them camp at a certain place, and they just stayed there. They had no reason. Why are we staying here? And they stayed there for a long time, and then finally the pillar of cloud moved somewhere else, and God, they had to move when God moves them. All right, wait for God to move you. Wait for God to give you that open door, and then go through it. All right, that's, that's the point. Let's just skip down to uh, verse 9. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. The meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. A little that a righteous man has is better than the, the riches of the wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. You know, if you think God isn't, isn't responding to you, he's not showing you what you need to do, it says God is beholding, and he knows the days of the upright. Make sure you are upright. Make sure you're walking in God's ways, and God knows everything about you. He knows the hairs on your head, everything. When he wants you to move, he will provoke you to move. All right, let's go down to, um, back to verse 18. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish. The enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish away into smoke. They shall vanish away. So this day is really, really getting close. And um, we're not going to have to wait too much longer for these things to come about. But the point I want you to make is that just if we're, if we're following in the steps of Abraham, just as God directed Abraham to move at times, and just as God directed Abraham to wait, sometimes for very long periods of time, we have to be dependent on him. In summary, our mentality, walking or crawling in the footsteps of Abraham, our mentality is that we must be willing to separate ourselves from our country, our friends, our extended family, in order to stay on the path. We need to wait for God to fulfill his promises and not be impatient or get ahead of God. We need to be prepared in advance to make very hard choices, just as Abraham was when he was willing to offer up his son. We need to have this mentality of being a foreigner and not accumulate or get attached to stuff because those things hold you back. And if God wants to move you or it's time to flee, you're not going to be able to take it with you. Remember Lot's wife. We have to keep our eyes on the goal, the kingdom. We have to stay kingdom focused. We cannot let our focus get off of that or we're going to get ourselves in trouble. You know, one of the things about walking in somebody's footsteps is if you follow their footsteps, you're guaranteed to get to the destination of where they are. Isn't that right? If you get off, if you get off, say, I can still get there if I go that way, and you don't follow the footsteps, chances are you're not going to make it to where they are. And see, the whole thing is being part of the seed of Abraham, being part of the resurrection of the just.